Life Audio. Hey, welcome to the Gospel Rant. I'm Dr. Bill Senyard with Gospel App Ministries, gospel-app.com. So welcome. Uh, Boy, this one's a tough one on the surface. What in the world is Jesus saying about revenge or stopping someone who's hurting you? I mean, this is this is widely discussed, right? We're in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus appears to be commanding victims to just let themselves be victimized over and over again. Well, is that right? No, no, of course not. So welcome. We're going to find out what Jesus really does say and mean about retaliation. You'll be surprised. And listen, if the pity hasn't dropped yet, and maybe today, uh, this whole concept of Sermon on the Mount, what is Jesus really trying to get across to us? Is it, is it new principles? Is it new legislation? Or is he saying something different? And listen, do us a favor and get the word out to someone. Uh, forward this, put this on Facebook, particularly someone you know who's been a victim. And you know a lot of them, maybe you, and maybe they felt abandoned by God, by church, by family. Maybe, maybe they were told by religious leaders that they just need to suck it up and put themselves back in harm's way. Uh, You know, we went through a phase of that where uh, abused wives were either being told that or it was implied that they should go back and submit to an abusive husband. I don't think that's uh, as big nowadays. I hope not anyway. But is that what Jesus is saying? And they use this verse. Oh my gosh, God help us. Well, no, this is going to be sweet, sweet, sweet music for them. Uh, At least that's my plan. So before we plunge into Jesus on retaliation, let's get a word from our sponsors. Miracles are everywhere. Let our adventure begin! Discover Pure Flix, your premium streaming service where faith and family values come home. Ready to have some fun? The most exclusive selection of quality, wholesome movies and series that will uplift your spirit. A man can argue whether God exists, but when he looks at his daughters, he knows. With new arrivals every week. Unbelievable. Save big and enjoy the possibilities, like invitations to exclusive theatrical screenings. I see it, so I believe it. Find out more by joining today at pureflix.com. The first ever statewide Tasting Texas Wine and Food Festival in San Antonio from October 27th through the 30th. Created in partnership with Visit San Antonio, Culinaria, and the James Beard Foundation. It includes three days at The Collective, a modern take on the grand tasting. Enjoy this all-inclusive and immersive experience. All food and beverage is included. You'll only need one ticket to enjoy it all. Get tickets now at tastingtexas.com. Come experience this unique festival in the culinary capital of Texas. San Antonio. All right, welcome back. Very familiar passage. Uh, Like I said, it's been, oh my goodness, the history of misapplying this is frightening, uh, misunderstanding, frightening. Here it is, Matthew 5, 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, let me just stop and say, look, on the surface, this is really effective justice strategy. It pushes against treating a crime lightly or uh, treating it too harshly. So this statement is symbolic and implies balance, equity, fairness, uh, um, equal justice for all. Doesn't push for this harsh, anger-driven revenge that if somebody takes your eye, you kill them, right? But don't take this literally, right? It's a wisdom saying. Matthew 5, 39. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Oh my gosh, there it is. And look, I don't know how you hear this, what you've been through, but if you've been uh, abused, if you've been treated with racism, chronic, if you've been raped, look, This could just trigger you, and I apologize for that. We're going to walk through this. Stick with us to the end, and I think you'll uh, be encouraged. Okay, the word resist is uh, antistemy, which means to oppose, to stand against. It can be resist, but the implication, I think, is that this is not the immediate knee-jerk reaction. Uh, So, you know, the fight, flight, and freeze 
This is more of the long-term strategy. How do you want to handle this situation? Somebody's abusing you, slapping you, hurting you, robbing you, uh, offending you, bullying you, that kind of thing. So I think it's more of a longer term. It's not, don't react, because you're, you're going to have to. The midbrain, fight, flight, freeze, your amygdala, God, God designed it, so Jesus designed it, so he knows that, okay? So, but still, who is going to just turn the other cheek? right? Is that a good strategy if you want to end uh, violence? I mean, I've seen that on Disney Channel, but really? And again, I hate to bring up this situation, but I think it, it, it brings, a, brings it to a point. Tell that to a rape victim. Really? Or tell that to a black youth pulled over for another DWB, driving while black or any other painful crime that really has hurt. I think that Jesus isn't talking about our midbrain's reactionary behavior, the fight, flight, flight, freeze. It's just more of a legal context, a long-term approach, I think. So someone did something to you, took something from you, abused you, pulled you over, whatever it might be. And after you've processed your reaction, you've breathed, you've let the cortisol out of your system, you know, two, three, four hours, uh, so now think through this. You don't need to take them to court. You don't need to call the police, even if they are evil incarnate. You don't need to, but you can, right? But it's not that reactionary behavior. Um, and so ramping it up, even if they've done something to publicly shame you, and, and that's what this is referring to, this backhanded slap on a cheek was a big deal in an honor-shame culture. It was a power trip in an honor-shame culture. It was meant to demean. See, in that culture, you would have to respond or be considered a coward or weak. I mean, th I mean, think of the uh, honor-shame cultures, China. Remember, there's 113 words and phrases that imply shaming, sh being shamed in, sh in China. Or think uh, in the, our gang culture. You know, if somebody hits you and you don't do anything, I mean, you're marked right? So is that what Jesus is saying? So according to Jewish writings, uh, that slap was doubly insulting and merited twice the fine. If, if somebody did that to you and they were fined and found guilty, twice the fine for a slap with an open hand. It was just embarrassing. So who would teach that someone who has been shamed in such a way, beat up, treated unjustly, chronically, and with respect, should just walk away or, or turn the other cheek? Well, Isaiah's Messiah does, but there's a kicker. So uh, hang, hang tight. Here's Isaiah 50 verses five through eight. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. There it is. See, that, that sounds like what Jesus could be referring to. This is what the Messiah is going to do. This is what he does. This is his heart. This is his spirit. Um, this is his choice. This is why he came for a bigger point. But, verse 7 and 8, listen to this, victim. But the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. I haven't been shamed. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. He who righteouses me, is the word, who, who makes me righteous, right, is near me. So who will contend with me? Let us stand up together, meaning me and the, the person who vindicates me. Who's my adversary? Yeah, let him come near to me. So the Messiah has this present visceral experience of God having his back, there's, and meaning there's justice involved, there's righteousness involved. It hurts, it's that persecution Jesus talks in the Beatitudes for doing the right thing. But it doesn't mean stop doing the right thing. It just means that you're going to be persecuted. There's a bigger picture you don't know about, and you will see it will bring you honor. All right? So the Messiah has a partner in crime, a benefactor whose presence changes things, makes the situation different, not less unjust, not less wrong, not less painful, but it changes the ultimate outcome. I mean, consider the cross. Horrific. And yet, you know, it's amazing what happened as a result. Um, that should be a little comfort, meaning you don't go through this alone. And there is a person who creates 
Otter, who is standing there doling it out to you, even though it doesn't feel like it at the time, right? So the one who gives him, with the one who gives him righteousness, right? That Think of a stuff that fills the victim with honor and name and vindication. With that, it's different. In that relationship with God alongside of me, and I'm feeling it, right? So uh, the still are victims, but not empty cup victims. They're full cup victims. I'm just saying uh, this ain't heaven, but better than the alternative. So the Messiah can make a choice, and he does. Uh, the, the Messiah can choose to honor the enemy, love the enemy. They can honor the evil one. They can, or not, by the way, there is a choice. Um, and before, what choice did we have? Our midbrain didn't have much of a choice. And culturally, oh my goodness, like I said, man, there's cultures where you don't stand up for yourself. It's just going to get a lot worse. Here's John Barclay, quote, but in the ancient world, Almost every aspect of worth, okay, there's that righteousness concept, almost every aspect of worth was dependent upon one's public reputation, which was insecure and perpetually contestable at almost every point. To maintain your worth, you had to keep asserting it and defending it in the awareness that others could at any moment make a claim by which your worth could be undermined or outclassed. The rumor mill was the Romans' social media, and they were ever anxious to make it clear that by one criterion or another, so wealth, ancestry, education, legal status, physique, ethnicity, or character, their honor could be established in comparison with others. As Cicero put it, by nature we yearn and hunger for honor, and once we have glimpsed, as it were, some part of its radiance, there is nothing we are not prepared to bear and to suffer in order to secure it. Paul's antidote, and Jesus' as well, by the way, Paul's antidote to the social poison has two ingredients. On the one hand, those who have been reconstructed by the Christ event are no longer invested in the forms of capital in which most people find their worth. Since ethnicity, status and gender are no longer criteria of superior worth, and since God pays no regard to the face but distributes his grace without regard to worth, the normal grounds for competition have lost their significance. The believer's true and only worth is constituted by his or her identity in Christ, a gift received, not a status inherited or achieved. And within the new community, there stand out those whose lives are marked most marked by the new ethos created by this gift. Those, for instance, who are spiritual and given responsibility insofar as they are attuned to the Spirit. All characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit are directed towards the construction of community from love onward. Spiritual people are so designated because they work with sensitivity to repair the community. Okay, and, and listen, that we're going to say more after the uh, word from our sponsor, but this includes choices that we made after we've been treated unjustly. We can make those choices. We have the spirit. We have a new motivation. We can actually begin to love and feel compassion a little for the uh, perpetrator. I'm not making it a law. He's not making it a law. I'm, he's just saying that there is a new dynamic. All right, we're going to take a short break for sponsors. See you in a moment. It's time for Medicaid Open Enrollment in Delaware. From Wilmington to Bethany Beach, connections run deep in the first state. And AmeriHealth Caritas Delaware is dedicated to connecting you to care. To learn more, visit AmeriHealthCaritasDE.com or call 800-996-9969. It's time for Medicaid Open Enrollment in Delaware. From Wilmington to Bethany Beach, connections run deep in the first state. And AmeriHealth Caritas Delaware is dedicated to connecting you to care. To learn more, visit AmeriHealthCaritasDE.com or call 800-996-9969. Okay, welcome back. <clears throat> Look, I don't know how that has hit you, but is it making a little sense what Jesus is saying? This world is still groaning. It still beats up people. They're still perpetration. There's still persecution. Jesus says so. Uh, but now you're going to be persecuted for doing loving things like Jesus. Okay? Matthew 5.40. Let's keep going. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Look, I mean, who would do that? I mean, honestly, if the court says, I fine you $50,000, who's going to give the $100,000? Uh, if, if someone loses a house in a divorce, what what are they going to give cars as well? Look, 
I'm just saying this seems like it's perpetrating injustice. It's enabling bad behavior. What about punishment uh, to discourage more abuse, right? Again, he's not legislating something new. Like, here's the new rule. If you're going to be a Christian, you have to do this. He, he, what he is saying is there's a new dynamic. If God is there, he has your back, he's making you feel right and honored, adored from him, you now have a choice. And your brain can go there. Uh, within a community of, of people giving you counsel and support, you, your brain can go there where it couldn't go before. This is not normal human behavior if you're alone and isolated, right? It's not normal human behavior if you're trying to survive. Are you with me? Matthew 5, 41. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. And again, you have a choice now. That's the idea. There's a bigger picture at play. There's a kingdom momentum and dynamic. 542. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, if you live in an urban center, you'd be broke if you tried to apply this. And I know people who have. Sometimes it is not wise. Think of an addict who is begging you for a loan, and they're just going to spend the money on alcohol or drugs or, right? It, sometimes it is not wise. Is Jesus saying that we should be legalistic, that we have to do this, whether it's wise or not, because this pleases God? No, that's missing the point. When the spirit of righteousness is poured out upon you, you now have an option you didn't have before. You have a choice. It's much bigger. And you can do it not as a victim, but as an honored one. He's speaking, remember, to the crowd who was on the other end of this. They were the victims. They were the poor in spirit. They likely didn't feel like they've been given equal justice or fairness. It probably they, they have many, many, many stories. They don't feel vindicated by the justice system or the religion. So they would be the last ones to agree with Jesus, humanly speaking. I mean, they would have been shaking their head going, what? No, 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 Jesus. Are you kidding me? You don't know what I've been through. No, I can't do it anymore. You know, how dare you? you do you know how I've been treated? You just bend over and let the bastards beat me up again? Really? That's not very good news. No, Jesus is telling true victims, the unenviable, the, that humanly speaking, you would never do this, right? No judgment. This is, this is who you are. But filled with this new dynamic, God's righteousness now seeing other people through a different God-Christ lens, now you see yourself hunger and thirsting for righteousness a little bit more, meaning caring for others more. A little, you have another option. And you're going to begin to feel like you want to do peacemaking, right? The Beatitudes. Right, the seventh Beatitude. So you're going to begin to look for a way to honor your enemy. Of course, you want to, not birthed out of you or your guilt and shame or some legalistic tendency, but it's erupting out of this new dynamic, this new sense of community, because you, the, the one who is righteousness, righteousnessing you <laughs> is right by your side, like the Messiah. So, all right, what about the abused spouse? Uh, male or female, by the way, I've seen both. Should he or she fight back? Should he react? Should they hurt the spouse? Well, first, you're going to, huh? you're going to want to because that's your midbrain. That's the fight, flight, freeze mechanism. Your amygdala is going to fight, flight, or freeze. And it's chemically driven. Um, good luck trying to stop that. Um, second, again, I think Jesus is saying that after a time, Spouse, after you have found a safe place, the cortisol has burned off, uh, the police have been called, maybe your abusive spouse is arrested, now you have a choice to get right up into the grill of the one who righteousness says victims, God, spirit, who embraces and holds onto the shamed ones like you, victims. He knows what that looks like, Jesus, right? He knows what abuse feels like. And he stood there and taken it, not because it was the right thing to do, because he, he really had a new motivation. He begins to fill the dried up cups. You, uh, you're, you're beginning to feel something of what the perpetrator took from you, put back a little bit, dynamic equivalence. Then another strategy can, ha can happen. It couldn't before. And it, 
this new strategy looks surprisingly more like Jesus, right? Who naturally loves enemies, sinners, abusers, liars, non-lovers like me, like you. You can't do this, period. But he can, and you have his spirit. Your role then is, you know, when cortisol is dripping off, it's gone. Your role is to begin to ask for power from God to, one, begin to feel loved again, lovable again, and two, begin to love the abuser with God's love, a little or a lot. Again, make sure that you're safe. This might include calling the police and the justice system. That's okay. And matter of fact, a smart thing to do. If somebody's, if your spouse is hitting you, call the police, run, get safe, right? But later in his love, you might begin to forgive injustice a little. Not, I'm not saying trust the person. I'm not saying move back in with them. I'm not, right? Uh, they might need time to cool off in jail, um, right? Okay, but let me give you an example. This is real life. One pastor discovered that one of the church staff was having an affair with a high school student, okay? Um, the staffer had been con confronted a year before by the board and swore nothing was going on, and the board believed him. The youth also swore nothing was happening, uh, all that was going on for a year until e then emails were found on the church computer and all hell broke loose. Parents were brought in, uh, spouses were brought in, police were called. I mean, it was a mess. So an emergency board meeting was called to talk about it, what to do, how do we handle this. Everyone was beyond enraged. As you can imagine, they had been lied to, they had been shamed, they had failed to protect the flock, betrayed. Uh, one of the, uh, two of the people they loved are in a wreck and families are in a wreck and a rape has occurred. So they were angry. It looked more like a, a lynch mob, though, than something Jesus might be excited about. And no judgment for me, because I get it. They were human. I understand, uh, as a pastor of almost 30 years now, I get their response. So the pastor stopped the meeting and told the board to go home and preach the simple and cluttered gospel themselves. They understood the simple and cluttered gospel, and they were given clear homework to ask for power from God in order to feel loved by him, first of all, personally, and then to access his love for the person who had been victimized and their families and the staffer uh, who was the perpetrator and the staffer's family. So um, at the next meeting, a couple days later, there was a different feel, I'm told, at least among much of the board. Uh, not all, but much. There was an even some weird, dangerous love uh, for the evil, for the evil action, um, for the perpetrator, on behalf of some of the board, the pastor says has, and t tells me. Not all. And again, no judgment. Human. And these were people, I, look, I totally get it. But something new was beginning to happen. The actions were condemned in the uh, harshest of terms. The staffer was, again, arrested, went to prison for rape, by the way. The church struggled through the betrayal and loss. But the board also struggled to find ways to preach the gospel to the perpetrator. I mean, who knows if, if it worked, if the staffer ultimately felt the love of Christ uh, before they went to prison and then while in prison. Um, but if they only knew what the first strategy was, all the anger and, and hatred from the first meeting, uh, this, was, this was so much better. So the difference between board meeting number one, imperfect, and imperfect board meeting number two was the pouring out of Jesus' spirit into the hearts of the hurt, betrayed, and wounded men and women. A very different response. Again, not perfect. So listen, we should be angry in the presence of evil and, and injustice and great unfair loss. But that anger now has an enemy, right? Remember the first antithesis of Jesus. Jesus turned the other cheek every day of his life. That's all he was doing. He showed what it looked like, and yes, it ended up with his death because persecution is inevitable. But what about the anger Jesus felt when he tossed the temple, you might ask? 
I think this I think this was more deliberate. In my opinion, this was not reactionary, but a prophetic activity. I wouldn't blame him if if it was reactionary. Man, I would have felt uh, despised, demeaned. I mean, he's God, and this is his house, and that stuff going on. But you're right, and here, here's why: because I think he was the incarnated God returning to the temple at last, and not since Ezekiel's vision of God's return had it happened. When God returned officially, the temple was riddled with idolatry. It's it's right. It's an aff- uh, affront to God, right in His face. So God does what God does. He He condemns the temple. And look, if you think that's angry, we're talking about God. It could have been really bad. So I don't think this was a knee-jerk fight, flight, or freeze reaction, as, as some portray. God didn't kill anyone. And he could, right? This is a capital offense. I think it's a very controlled reaction. I think he is fulfilling prophecy, my opinion. Uh, since death was legally called for, this was frankly pretty gentle and meek and honestly closer to turning the other cheek in, in some ways. Push back, Bill at gospel appcom and saying that, Jesus will turn the other cheek again and submit to die from this institution. Here's Barclay again. Within this community, honor, by the way, and also righteousness, does not have to be sought, meaning within the God community, the Christ community, all the honor that counts has already been given or will be given by God. Believers are freed from the need to establish their honor through competition or in retaliation against those who harm them. Let me say that again. Believers are freed from the need to establish their honor through competition or in retaliation against those who harm them. Uh, come on, victims, you have to scratch your head and pause and, and dwell on that a little bit, but I'm totally on board with that. Okay, back to the quote. Uh, believers are freed from the need to establish their honor through competition or in retaliation against those who harm them, and they can afford to grant honor without reservation to others. In fact, Paul outlines, and Jesus buys into it, a paradoxical inversion of the normal honor quest. In loving one another, believers strive to take the lead, not in claiming honor, but in giving it to one another. Because this is done in a reciprocal way, no one is left demeaned, but all are supported within a community where every member matters. Summary. Now you have an option in the Christ community with God's spirit, with God nearby you, doling out righteousness and honor and faith. Victims, we now have an, a different approach. We now have a choice. Um, on a big scale, we can do something dramatically different, and it's by that love they will know you're a Christian. By the way, by that kind of love, I know I'm a Christian. Okay, that's all for this podcast. I hope it's making sense. Push back, bill at gospel-app.com. Thanks again to lifeaudio.com. Check all podcasts on their sites. Also, pass the word about the Gospel Rant to others you know, particularly victims or people who've been victimized in their life and struggling with this. Maybe you've left church over this. This is important and life-changing stuff. Parent, check out Good Enough Parent. It's free, goodenoughparent.online. Check it out. You'll be so glad you did. Take heart, child of God. Miracles are everywhere. Let our adventure begin! Discover Pure Flix, your premium streaming service where faith and family values come home. Ready to have some fun? The most exclusive selection of quality, wholesome movies and series that will uplift your spirit. A man can argue whether God exists, but when he looks at his daughters, he knows. With new arrivals every week. Unbelievable. Save big and enjoy the possibilities, like invitations to exclusive theatrical screenings. I see it, so I believe it. Find out more by joining today at pureflix.com. It's time for Medicaid Open Enrollment in Delaware. From Wilmington to Bethany Beach, connections run deep in the first state. And AmeriHealth Caritas Delaware is dedicated to connecting you to care. To learn more, visit AmeriHealthCaritasDE.com or call 800-996-9969.